I want to bring in now CBS News foreign correspondent MTS Tayeb. He's there in Tel Aviv. MTS, first of all, talk to us about what you're seeing, what you're hearing there now that we understand that uh, that drones have been launched from Iran and are headed over to Israel. Yeah, hey, Lana, good to be with you. Well, you're absolutely right. We have confirmation from the Israeli military that those drones have been launched. Uh, we understand that they are currently in Iraqi airspace, but we also understand that these drones could likely take up to nine hours to even get anywhere near Israel. Nine hours, that's a very long time. So the question then becomes is what, at what point does Israel, which has one of the most sophisticated uh, aerial defense systems in the world, will intercept those drones? And if these are, well, they are the Iranian drones, but if they are the variety that we've seen Iran use in other arenas, uh, and this notably when it comes to Russia, Russia purchases Iranian drones, which are called Shahid drones, and they use them in Ukraine, and Ukraine very successfully shoots those out of the sky. So one would imagine that that is something that Israel will be able to do. Whatever the case, we have, of course, uh, been hearing from the Israeli military who say that they are monitoring the situation. Uh, we heard from, as you were saying, uh, from uh, Hagari, who was saying that uh, not only is the aerial defense array system on high alert, but so too is the Israeli Air Force, the Israeli Navy, uh, but more importantly, that they are also working in concert with uh, the U.S. as well. So. There's a lot of moving parts here right now. This is, of course, concerning. But again, when we look at the timeline of how long these drones could potentially reach Israeli airspace, if they ever do, the question is, is what is Iran trying to achieve? And more importantly, is this all they're going to do or is this the beginning of what they're going to do? And again, what they're going to do because of what? This is in retaliation for that strike in Damascus at the Iranian embassy there in which 12 people were killed, including a senior uh, military commander from Iran. Since then, Iran has been vowing that it would avenge that attack, and now it's started. But again, we have many, many more questions than answers. But all we can say or what we do know for sure is that this has begun. Uh, MTS. As we have heard that that so many of the different principal actors in this want to bring down the temperature uh, on the situation. And, and given that you mentioned that Israeli defense forces are positioned uh, through the Iron Dome there to potentially take down all of these drones before they ever make it uh, into uh, to make a strike in Israel. Will that be sufficient? Do we have any sense of how much uh, retribution uh, Iran feels like they need in order to at a minimum save face following the killing of those military leaders. Yeah, you know, you bring up a really fascinating point, Lana, which is you know, that's really what this is about. Iran feeling like it has to respond and it has to show this show of force. And that is what's kind of fueling this. And so, you know, when you talk about uh, there are obviously other actors involved, the U.S. a very key player in this, calling for restraint. We understand that over the past several days that the U.S. has been communicating with Iran through the Swiss embassy inside Tehran. Switzerland has an embassy in Tehran. And so the U.S. sends messages to the Swiss embassy, which then goes to the Iranian leadership, who then communicate again through the Swiss embassy back to the U.S. And we know that there has been a lot of this communication been going on. And what we understand from that communication is that both the Iranians and the U.S. have said that they do not want a major escalation, that they do not want to trigger a wider war across the Middle East, which many people say would be catastrophic. In saying that, as you so rightly point out, Iran feels a lot of pressure to do something. The question is, is will they do something beyond what we're seeing now, which is the launch of these drones from its airspace now traveling here to Israel? Again, it's going to take nine hours for those drones to get here if they ever do. And, you know, you again raise a very important point. Is that enough for destroying an embassy, which Iranians have said was an attack on their sovereignty? Because as we know, embassies are effectively uh, sovereign sovereignty 
soil for that specific nation. Uh, and if there's going to be anything more they're going to do in response to that. But again, because we know that Iran has been saying that it doesn't want to see a wider escalation, and yet its proxies are very active in the region, it's really hard to see just where this goes beyond this point. That said, it is still very alarming. The idea that Iran could potentially target inside Israel. This is one state attacking another state. That would be very serious indeed and is something that has not happened in a very long time, at least in this context. And so it would be very, very worrying indeed. Uh, MTS, for our viewers, you are there in Tel Aviv. It's about 1030, I think, at night there at this point, so late in the evening. Uh, it's going to be several hours before those uh, weapons actually make their way to Israel. What are you hearing there, as, given that especially they may land in early morning? Yeah, the mood is really interesting. You know, we obviously have been here all day and you sort of walk around Tel Aviv and things seem pretty normal. People were out and about. People were going to restaurants, at the beach, going up about the day. It's the day off today. It was Shabbat uh, for the daytime hours. So, you know, it was relatively quiet to begin with. But I would say that, you know, Things have changed very quickly this evening. We had an announcement from the Israeli government saying that they were basically canceling school tomorrow, that people were not supposed to gather uh, in very large groups. And that sort of started trickling out more and more. And then we heard that Israel's security cabinet was joining. And now, of course, we have the announcement that this, uh, these drones have been launched from Iran. Um, so it will be interesting to see just sort of in the next day or so or in the next hours or so to see what happens and how people are going to react. But the reality is, is that people have been told, be prepared. Something is potentially happening. And that is why those um, uh, uh, rulings, if you will, or, or those requests for people to, again, as we say, don't send your kids to school, uh, don't gather in very large groups, uh, were put out, and it's hoped that people will follow those rules. Uh, but we have to understand that for six months now, since October 7th, Israel has been on, for lack of a better phrase, war footing. This is a country which is in the grips of a, of a conflict, which is dealing with what many people here say is a national trauma, which they are still living because of the hostages still inside Gaza. Uh, and and of course, the fact that there is still fighting going on in Gaza. And as we know, inside Gaza, the situation there, the humanitarian situation there is pretty catastrophic as well. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I think the, the idea that Iran would try to launch some sort of attack on Israel is definitely alarming to people. But again, people we've been speaking to have a lot of faith in, as you say, the Iron Dome. They have a lot of faith in Israel's defense systems. They have a lot of faith in the Israeli military, even though part of that was shaken after October 7th. And there's a lot of criticisms of the Israeli military for not responding more quickly to that. Still, I think, again, because we're at this point seeing drones being launched from Iran, it's going to take many hours for there to get them. I don't get the sense of any sort of national panic or hysteria. Mm -hmm. But again, it's obviously very concerning for the president. It's very concerning for the Israeli leadership. And that is why at this moment, so many high profile and so many high level um, interactions are happening at this stage to figure out not only what's happening, but what could potentially happen next. All right, wow. MTS, we will continue to check in with you for now. Please be safe. I want to bring in now CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazas from our Washington bureau. Olivia, we have been on standby for this. We knew that it might be happening. Even President Biden, you're looking at live images right now, has determined that he needed to come back to the White House. This is his helicopter at Joint uh, Base Andrews. Uh, the president is on his way to the security room to meet with his national security team and try and assess the situation as we now know that there are several drones making their way from Iran to Israel and will be making their way there in the next couple of hours. So, Olivia, talk to us about how U.S. and Israeli officials have been preparing for this attack.
Sure, Lana. Well, as you've been discussing, this was a very telegraphed uh, response. We have effectively known since April 1st, that Damascus strike, that this was coming. And uh, that's why you've seen this torrent of public messaging and diplomatic efforts vis-a-vis -vis Iran. The U.S. has been remarkably transparent about what it's been seeing, what it's been hearing, and the kinds of messages that it's been delivering and receiving uh, from Iran in the run-up to this action. The Israelis, similarly, have been telegraphing their level of preparedness and what prepar preparatory steps they're taking in order to respond when they need to respond. Likewise, you've seen dozens of Western governments pick up the phone and call the foreign minister in Tehran to urge restraint, to urge caution, uh, and to, to prevent this uh, conflict from escalating regionally. You've seen, by the way, the Iranians take those calls. They feel like they're a player, and they have been effectively telegraphing and calibrating their response. All of this has been designed, of course, in order to uh, shape Iranian behavior. And I think that you are seeing that. It is very early, as we've been saying. We do not know what else is to come. But this does not initially appear to be a worst-case scenario. As we've been discussing, drones have a very long lead time. They are easy to intercept. Israel and the U.S. have excellent air defenses, and they are very much prepared for and anticipating an attack of this sort. We always expected that the Iranians would do something visible, uh, that they would target something with uh, an Israeli government nexus. We do not know yet what the targets are. And I'm not sure that we know that these drones are coming from inside Iran. I am waiting for confirmation on that detail, because, as we know, Iran had a spectrum of potential behaviors to reach for here. They could have— uh, uh, launched things from inside of Iran. They could have enlisted its proxies. They could be reaching for targets inside Israel. They could be reaching for targets outside of Israel in, in the region. Uh, they could be uh, targeting things that are designed to incur casualties or not. Right now, and again, early stages, it appears to be at the lower end of the escalatory spectrum. We have to see if this is followed or accompanied by uh, ballistic or cruise missiles, which we know from our Pentagon team, Iran was also preparing. Um, and, uh, and I, we, I thought course, I would say, no Olivia, um, if, if you will, uh, on that question that you raised, according to the IDF, the, the drones that were launched came from within uh, Iran, Iran's own territory. But as you mentioned, this may not be the end of action. There may, there may be additional action that could come from proxies. Uh, we certainly know that Iran has supported many other groups, including Hamas, operating inside of Gaza. But uh, I want, I, as, as you're talking about um, Iran actually t heeding some of these messages that are coming from the United States, and given that there are no direct diplomatic ties between the two, what is the potential that something could go wrong, given how, how highly sensitive all of this is at this very moment? Absolutely. And, and, Lana, on that point, I would say, if, if it is indeed the case that these drones were launched from inside Iran, that is significant. Iran and Israel, despite all of their animosity over the years, have never, as far as I'm aware, and I spoke with officials about this today, directly exchanged strikes from inside their territory. So mm. that is uh, a significant development, if it is, uh, in fact, confirmed. Right. That and, that is, and that's from the IDF spokesperson, but CBS has not independently confirmed that additionally. Understood. But, right, to, I mean, Iran has often reached for its proxies in order to maintain that veneer of deniability, that it wasn't directly involved. If it's decided to drop that veneer, uh, then that, I think, uh, is notable, even if, it, if we don't know, again, uh, what else is to come and whether this is the extent of it. Uh, I think that uh, U.S. involvement here has been telegraphed. The Iranians know that the U.S. is prepared to respond defensively and, therefore, uh, are unlikely to sort of respond to defensive responses. Uh, but, of course, as you mentioned, there's a lot of room for miscalculation. There's a lot of room for emotions to intervene. There's a lot of room for political calculus. There are, of course, a lot of questions about who has an interest in this war spreading uh, and who doesn't. The mm. U.S. has very clearly uh, made its case that it is in nobody's interest uh, for this uh, to expand into a regional conflagration. I think the Iranians have long made the calculus. I spoke to uh, lots of senior uh, foreign intelligence uh, officials who have handled Iranian portfolios who have said that the supreme leader in Iran uh, is known to be risk-averse. Right now, at a moment where Iran sort of 
feels confident, feels like things are in the region are going in its fa favor, that uh, Israel is sort of becoming more of a pariah, or at least more isolated. Why would they uh, sort of alter their risk calculus to be more risk-prone mm. rather than risk-averse? Um, again, and that's based on, uh, you know, the analysts who have looked at the supreme leader's behavior over the years. Uh, so it would be an, an interesting choice. It would be a notable choice if this became meaningfully escalatory. But again, we do not know whether this is the extent of it and what uh, the response, the nature of the response from Israel is going to be. Very interesting points, Olivia. Especially, we do know that uh, that Iran's supreme leader has pledged that retribution. Uh, remind uh, our viewers about the attack in Syria, about the military leaders who were killed in that, and why Iran is taking it so seriously, and and why they believe that Israel was responsible, though Israel has not claimed responsibility. Sure. Israel hasn't claimed responsibility, and the U.S. has, as far as I'm aware, not yet confirmed that it was, in fact, a diplomatic facility that was targeted, although indications are that it, that it was. Uh, this was a high-value target, according to the Israelis, a uh, top general within the IRGC, arguably somebody they saw as more effective on the battlefield than, for example, the Quds Force commander. They saw an opportunity, and they sought it out. I am told that, generally speaking, the Mossad is, is tasked with sort of doing a risk calculus before such strikes. You have a window of several hours before you have to go in order to determine what the uh, response might be. And its intelligence services would have said, OK, we think that uh, it, this is worth taking a shot. The value of removing this person from the battlefield uh, is going to exceed what we expect Iran will do in, in response. Um, that's based on conversations with intelligence officials who understand how this process works, not based on anything specific about this situation. Um, but you also know that Israel wants Iran to think that nobody who has uh, its interests or, or who works against its interests is safe anywhere. Uh, there are questions about whether the timing of this attack was particularly prudent. Uh, the U.S., of course, has said that it had no heads up that it was going to happen. Uh, I am not aware whether the Israelis have, uh, in the aftermath, sort of offered justification or their uh, internal risk calculus for taking the strike. But the fact is that it has set in motion uh, these kinds of unpredictable uh, tit-for-tats, and we'll see whether uh, that escalatory ladder goes up or down from this point. Uh, and, Olivia, appreciate all of the information and the context that you're giving our viewers in this moment. I will say I was just handed uh, a piece of paper that says that CBS News can confirm through a U.S. official that the drones were launched from within Iranian territory, which, as you point out and help us to understand, is a very big difference in how Iran has previously interacted with Israel. I know you're going to continue working the phones and speaking with your sources, and we will check back in with you. Olivia, thank you. I want to bring in now CBS News national security contributor Sam Vinograd. She is the former acting assistant secretary for counterterrorism. So, Sam, we were talking just yesterday about the heightened alert, that these warnings were coming out. Now it seems that we at least have some measure of how Iran is responding in their retaliatory action. What did your very first impressions, given that they are drones that we're hearing that were launched from within Iranian territory, and that they're going to take several hours before they make it to Israel? Well, let's just take a step back for a moment. We, anybody that knows anything about the region, about security, is going to acknowledge that this is simply an initial stage of an attack. We don't know what else may right. be coming. And I imagine, Lana, that that is exactly what President Biden is likely discussing with his principals, principals uh, in his cabinet, key national security officials, when they meet momentarily in the Situation Room. Having been in many of those meetings, typically they kick off with an intelligence briefing. In this case, it would likely be the latest and greatest intelligence on operational updates as it pertains to Iran's retaliatory attack. Number two, it would be about Iran's intentions, uh, intelligence about whether Iran intends to escalate further. And then finally, intelligence on whether there are any specific threat streams that could impact U.S. interests in the region, whether that be military facilities, embassy and consulates, or just Americans in general. After that intelligence briefing, I would imagine, in light of the fact that we now know that drones have been launched from Iran itself, 
the Department of Defense would likely brief the president and the rest of the national security officials in the room on what assets both we and Israel have available from an aerial defense perspective to mitigate these drones and any missiles that may also be striked. Keep in mind that these drones are flying over other countries where the United States has military assets and mm -hmm. where the United States does have capabilities to mitigate projectiles uh, overhead. So the president is undoubtedly being briefed on what we can do to help mitigate anything in the airspace on the way from Iran to Israel. And then finally, I would imagine the president is getting operational security updates on enhancements that have been made to protect Americans in the region, to include uh, force protection measures to protect military facilities, whether that's vessels or military bases, and then whether any additional assets are needed to surge to embassies and consulates in the region, primarily Israel, Lebanon, and then I would also put in there Iraq and probably Egypt, uh, whether any additional security assets are needed to protect embassies and consulates in the region if this does escalate further. So that uh, national security meeting that is about to kick off is going to be critical in terms of figuring out what assets may be deployed to keep Israel safe, Lana, but also to keep Americans safe. And Sam, on that point, what are the risks to American personnel? We know that that President Biden has been telegraphing. Uh, and as you as we've been discussing, there is no direct diplomatic ties between the United States and Iran. But we know that he has been telegraphing that if Americans are injured in these retaliatory attacks, that that would further bring the United States into the conflict, something as a warning for Iran to try to avoid that. But how how has that message been received? And how likely is it that that American personnel could potentially be at risk? Well, there's really three ways that the president can and has been messaging to the Iranians not to mess with the United States. First, he said so publicly. Second, the United States does have private channels uh, through both the Swiss and was reported on in the press as well through the Omanis to pass messages to the Iranians. And there have been reports that both of those channels have been used to send a message to Iran not to involve the United States in whatever it is planning from a retaliatory perspective. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, the United States has also been working the phones to encourage countries who have leverage over Iran to include China to tell Iran not to escalate further and to calibrate its response. So it's the public messages, it's the messages through uh, third parties like the Swiss and the Omanis, and then it's asking others with leverage on Iran, like the Chinese who have a strong trading relationship with Iran, to tell Iran to calibrate its response. We don't know how Iran has reacted to those messages, but what we do know is that regardless of whether Iran intends to strike Americans, these missiles, these projectiles are not always totally accurate, um, despite uh, many of them being precision guided. So Americans are at risk immediately in the region based upon um, the aerial uh, activities underway. And further, more strategically, Lana, this could inspire Iranians' proxies to launch attacks against Americans in places like Iraq and Syria, where they've done that in the past, as well as individuals here in the United States, um, homegrown violent extremists, to be inspired by what they're seeing to act. So it, it is a high um, intensity moment um, based on my discussions with officials in, in the administration and my work in the administration before leaving in December 2023. There are extensive contingency plans in place and an extensive intelligence gathering apparatus that is trying to follow any specific or credible threats to Americans, whether overseas or here in the homeland. And Sam, very quickly before uh, we let you go, talk to us about the defensive capabilities. As you mentioned, the United States has assets in the uh, geography between Iran and, uh, and Israel. In addition to Israel's um, world-famous Iron Dome. How likely is it that any of these drones will be able to actually permeate into, uh, into Israeli airspace in a way that leads to any casualties? Well, first on the Israeli side, Israel actually has a multi-layered aerial defense system. It's not just Iron Dome. They also have assets called David Sling and Arrow 1 and 2 that really want to mitigate drones, excuse me, mitigate uh, incoming um, projectiles at various altitudes and various speeds, whether that be ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, or rockets. So they have a multi-layered aerial defense system, an aerial defense array, as the IDF calls it. 
The United States has various assets throughout the region, including in the likely flight path of the drones from Iran to Israel um, that could mitigate uh, those drones as well, whether it's fighter jets or other air defense systems. If Iran does launch a cruise missile from Iran, the United States also has capabilities to mitigate cruise missiles and ballistic missiles. So that is exactly why the Department of Defense has been working so closely with the Israelis, not just today, but dating back decades to ensure that we have a cohesive, multi-layered uh, air defense system to protect Israel and to protect American assets from any um, uh, incoming from Iran that could be harmful. All right, Sam, thank you very much. We'll continue to check in with you throughout the evening as well as tomorrow.